Hello, everybody. And here is our panel, Ari, MJ, and the background uh, support for tonight is kindly provided by the wonderful Summer Banks. Um, if you could please come up uh, here, guys, it would be amazing. Here we all are. Hey, hello. Um, and the, the panel that we are streaming today is about uh, cultures and very specifically about the cultures that we meet in, a, in, in an improv setting, right? In, in improv classes or shows or yeah, just hanging out with your friends. Um, we are three instead of four uh, for tonight. Unfortunately, Tanya and Donais could not be uh, with us for family reasons, but this is not the last time we are talking about cultures, so I'm sure she will join us some other time. And yeah, here, here we are. Um, I will I don't want to introduce because you you both because you're very well known already, MJ and, and Ari. Yes, MJ, you're famous. Uh, and also your your biographies are in the description of the event. But I um, I would like to um, maybe start by by asking. Uh, what is your, um, if we can give me just a second. Um, if we can just uh, talk about what is, um, what is your, your um, if we can give me just a second. Up. Um, Checking, checking in the video quality as, as usual, never works. Um, uh, somewhere, I, I hope it, it works now. Um, anyways, um, what we would like to talk about is mostly why cultures are important and why cultures usually go unnoticed. And my first question would be, if you were, if you had a chance to talk to yourself like many, many years ago, what would you wish that earlier version of yourself um, in Improv Class 101 knew about playing with improvisers from all over the world that you know now? Oh, okay, I'm gonna go first because... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I think I was really lucky, though, uh, in early improv classes where I could be who I am. Um, it was very accepting. Uh, I grew up in Toronto, so in that way, although, I mean, always, and I think I always have to remind myself that whoever, and I think it really happened when I had a, a, a baby, that whoever you are is perfect. That's what I would like, I wish I had said to myself as a child. You know, I, I remember spending so much time like looking in the mirror and seeing all my imperfections and seeing how um, like I look different than my friends, I look different than others. And that was like a huge waste of time because everyone's features are like beautiful, right? And we're born, we're born with so much intelligence, we're born with so much heart, we're born with so um, many things that I would just, and I, I have to say that to myself, like before auditions, that, um, like that you're amazing. <laughs> you are amazing, though, MT. You are amazing. <laughs> are you? Stop it. So, you are too. <laughs> but like that's the thing that I think there's so many like stuff in the media that you know going through magazines and television shows growing up where I didn't see myself. Mm -hmm. then I would think something's wrong with me, so. Mm -hmm. um, for me, if I tell myself of uh, impro improv days of the of early, early years, I would say to use yourself a little bit more um, because I come from Asia, I come from Indonesia and all my all my life experiences up to that point was built up in Asia and then all the improv I did was in the Netherlands uh, at that point. 
And so I would try to fit in what do the what do the Dutch comedy scene want? What are the reference that they do? Uh, instead of using what I already have, which is more authentic and more genuine and more deep as well. But back then, you're sort of trying to fit in a, a certain framework and not appear to be the the strange person. Yeah. But it took me um, maybe maybe ten years before I I finally make a, made a an all Asian team and then used all these things out and then it feels so natural. It feels also very much like a cathartic, like a release. And it's it's just all these pent up experiences that you want to use on improv. Yeah, it's amazing that well, my own experiences, I guess, is, is in, in somewhere in the middle between, between you two. So yes, I definitely wanted to fit in as a new improviser. And I definitely wanted to to be accepted by the team and, and kind of play with their style. But um, I was also very lucky to, to, to play with improvisers from all over the world in that team. And they were pretty accepting of like, yeah, okay, you can be who you are. But there is still that, that that fear of what if I come come out as weird or what if I'm not enough or what if somebody does not understand my reference? What if, right? So the concept of group mind that especially the beginner improvisers work on a lot, like how do we all come and play together and be on the same page? It usually, presumes that there is that group mind where everybody's kind of the same or can catch the references. And then if, if those are cultural references or idioms of something very specific to the location we're in, then it could get tricky. And this is something that I've heard from many improvisers, not necessarily even from different cultures. They could be from the same cultures, but for example, from different um, generations and then it's like okay we have completely different frames of reference and we don't really share the group mind how would we describe that what is the group mind where everybody is who they are how would that look like absolutely I think I mean um... Group mind should be that everyone chips in a little bit in the idea and then builds around it as, as one big whole. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the in the in the beginning times, uh, you would you were not sure how to shape them together like a big you know what is called the school of fish. So you try to find what's the most common references out of them all. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny because I was doing improv in the Netherlands and then our improvisers were was from Nigeria, Pan Panama, Indonesia, and Netherlands. And then we found the reference that we understood the best is Hollywood references, Hollywood. American references. Uh, so at, at the same time, it sort of like push, puts us together in a group setting very quickly. Um, that, that part is good, but it also should not limit you to, to, to explore things that are your own personalities. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was uh, I was taught with always choose to know. So when someone would make a reference that was um, something that I wasn't familiar with, but I could, you could sense that it was about, um, like it was specific from their culture, but you could sense it was something about food or something about um, how their culture views the world. Uh, that was, then you choose to know as an improviser that, uh, and it did depend on the school and in terms of how open they were and how open the teachers were about who they are and their philosophy. So some schools I did find um, where, I mean, the teachers were not as in tune with other cultures as other schools were. Uh, and in that, the scenes and the work, like on the shows, everything was very reflective of kind of that small world. And sometimes like in certain environments, they do think they're better than others, you know? 
right? Which I, I never think that's, it's like you're closing down stuff. And so the world gets really small. And when that happens, I do find that I can't bring in because it won't be accepted. I can't bring in elements of my culture. And then of course, I choose not to be involved in that school anymore because I'm like, well, why? Uh, why shut that part of me off? I do find lately there's been more acceptance and more openness of, of being able to talk about who you are and being supported in that. But it, it does depend on how long, I mean, there's some schools where people have trained there for so long and sometimes I think too long because then it just your mind gets a bit atrophied in terms of one perspective of improv mm -hmm. that's what I think and when that happens um, and then they think that's the right way which there isn't a right way right there's so many great different ways and there's so many great similarities and when that happens then um, new ideas are kind of shut down where when you improv with the people in that group uh, those like those gifts that you give as an improviser they're not picked up and those I'm usually for me the gifts I give are, are based on my culture or who I am and when they're not picked up it's it's really hard <laughs> like, you just feel like, <laughs> like was I could I not speak properly <laughs> like what happened like what and then but then as an improviser you try to keep on bringing that those little elements back in different ways like hey you know um and in the end, I like I I try to at least always try to be heard in terms of those stuff. Like, and also the idea of family, the idea of friends, and the idea of because we all live in this world where we could be friends with so many different people, and um and we could share those little elements, right? Because there's so many similarities in in different cultures too. Am I talking too much? <laughs> I also want to add, at least for my experience, it it doesn't come necessarily from a place of of harm but a place of, of practicality and conveniences. And also, I mean, not everyone is a professional improviser. They don't know how to process it as well. So MJ and I probably had a lot of experiences where you give a, a references of, you know, a, a, a satay with a peanut butter skewer. And then the other improviser go, okay, I'm just, I didn't hear that. I'm just going to continue the scene because I don't know how to process it, right? So it doesn't always come from this is how you should do it, but it's 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 a skill to build uh, to include these things into your improv. Yeah. But that that's a that's a tricky part, right? I I mean, I know the answer, but I don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to impose that this is the only right answer. Um, it's a tricky balance between choosing to know everything and uh, also being um, willing to, to, to stay very like specific and uh, bring in the references that everybody would, would understand. And I love that you've mentioned uh, Hollywood movies, Ari, because this I see a lot, because we could assume that everybody would have the same kind of references. So we could, if we go, if we mention a supermarket, we could mention Walmart and probably everybody would know, or the, the majority of people would know that this is a supermarket because they've seen it in at least one movie. But if we mention one of the um, local supermarkets, um, European ones, uh, then only the locals would, would understand. The same is with the types of um, cutlery or with the types of food, etc. cetera. Um, and I know that for the, the more experienced improvisers, it's like, yeah, I can support, even if I don't know what that is, I will grab that and make make it believe that I do know. Maybe we'll invent a new re reality when that thing, when a skewer is a, a spaceship, great. Now it's a spaceship. But what if there is a fear of offending somebody? What if there is a fear of, oh, um, I don't want to use that reference because what if it's too specific and, and I, I use it wrong. Yeah, I guess my question is, what if what if using that or supporting it comes off as wrong? 
I see. Uh, MJ, you want to take that? Oh, okay. Um, um, for me, it's it's all about goodwill. Yeah, how how you take uh, these things that you don't know. These some things are in the border of what you know and what you don't know. And I've I've played a lot of American scenes where they throw a brand at me, and I'm I don't know what it is. But as long as I keep having a goodwill that it's something something okay, and not try and and not see it in a negative way. I think you're you can get away with a lot of things. I show you an example. I, I think um, there was a there was a scene by Jay Suko where he was playing with uh, Sumit Mehta out of um, Gurugaon, India, and then at some point, uh, Sumit gave him this is a pan, and a pan is sort of like a it's an after meal thingy on a leaf. I'm not sure either what it is. And you you know that Jay doesn't know what it is, but he just accepted it, and 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 he sort of felt what's around it, what's playable with it. And as Sumit gave him a little bit more, then he plays a little bit more. So it's it's he's really exploring this 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 pun. It's very interesting to see. But if you're a but if one is a, a new improvisers, they get into a very defensive mode. They get a pun and it's like, what is this? I don't know. Get that away from me. Right. So it's about, about patience, about uh, experience and about goodwill. That's what I say. Awesome. So yeah. you mean you mean also patience and, and experience like from the players who give those suggestions or yeah, from 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 both sides. So if you are the one to receive, you're sort of figuring out what it is, mm -hmm. uh, and and playing it smoothly. If you're the one giving, you would also read your partner's uh, language. That how much do they know about this, and then maybe like insert a little bit more information about this. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's also fear. You know, fear of. Um of being offensive, being considered racist, being considered um, ignorant, uh, and and also fear of trying to be funny. You know, if I think a lot of times, especially with short form, it's all it is about the game. It's about being funny. It's about that. And if you just let that go and know that you already are funny, like everyone is right. Kids are born funny. So and let go of of and and what Ari said, taking the time, right? And, and improvisers can see when, uh, sorry, my daughter has her band right now. <laughs> she's, she's playing flute. Improvisers can see when, when, that, when you do give something very specific and the other person might not necessarily pick up on it. And so if you do give that more information, then it's that give and take. Mm -hmm. I think if, we, if improvisers approach scenes with calmness, and know mm -hmm. that they already i mean we already we already know when someone like that's a beautiful when someone just gives you something and just to treat it right you, you can have a perspective on it um and it, you i mean the way that i was probably given was you could tell it was food right mm -hmm. so in that i mean jay is a master at um accepting very specific things and um and taking the time He's, I've mm -hmm. seen so many scenes of him where he could he could do that so effectively, but I think if we can, I think with new improvisers, if you can let them know that, I mean, there's some schools where they like to bash you and make you feel very small and make you feel like you're incapable. But I find if you just allow people to know that their whole life they're they've been capable, then um, then they will really rise. I at least I have found even inexperienced improvisers because they bring in so much of them of who they are in the scenes and that's really wonderful when they can do that and not feel like you know i i, I honestly hate like american references i grew up in canada where america you know and i think a lot of countries feel this way where america's like this big thing that's going to take over the world yeah. so i i'm not i generally don't like to use um like even American holidays, I I can't, I live in America right now, but I like I'm a bit opposed to American holidays just because I feel like there's so many wonderful other holidays that we can certainly and because America's filled with so many different cultures, let's celebrate those. Those are really like they have a longer history and with a lot, lot more depth. So. Mm -hmm. mm.
I love that. Um, also, because uh, MJ, you're directing right now a show that's called Celebration, and it's all about bringing in improvisers from all over the world and letting them be who they are and, and bringing in uh, very specific cultural references from, from what they want to, to play with. And I think that's amazing. But that also, uh, like the, the atmosphere that you create in the rehearsal, and I think we all come to, to the same point where it's like, it requires a lot of confidence and it requires that, that atmosphere, that, that space where everybody is welcome and everybody is accepted, no matter how outlandish or, or unusual your um, thing that you bring in, your uh, suggestion, your offer would be, it's you, so I'm gonna treat that with respect and I'm gonna treat this as something valuable. What I really like is when improvisers keep that sense of um, curiosity and wonderment, like whatever that, I have no idea what pan is, but if that's a thing that you're bringing in, oh, thank you for this gift. Oh my God, this is amazing. I want to know more. I want to play with this, right? Um, but then uh, how do we create the culture when, when it's, how do we create, like, okay, I, I'm, I'm teaching a lot of uh, directing courses or like, supportive courses rather than, you know, um, specifically improv skills. So for me, it's all about how do we create a culture where these things are normalized, where it's not just MJ and Ari and Irina and Tanin, but everybody thinks that, yeah, it's totally normal. And the question, um, or Rather, the whole idea why I, I'm interested in this is because on Zoom, our world is suddenly so much bigger. The world of online improv connects people from like uh, all time zones, all possible countries, and we no longer have that, that um, limitation of like where everybody looks the same and we don't need to know about other cultures. We, we have this chance to bring everything in, um, but I don't see that happening for some reason. And that's a big question for me. Why don't I see more shows like Celebration? Why don't I see more, um, I see shows with international casts but they're still playing with proto-American or quasi-American settings. Why do you think that is? I know for me, you need to, the director needs to take the time to um, hear people's stories and for the cast members to hear their stories as well. If you don't even just take that time, then I know for me, I wouldn't feel safe to bring in elements of my culture. Mm -hmm. There's been too many times where I've brought in elements of my culture and now I'm a bit more forthright about it, uh, where it's, it's just been dropped or there's been too many questions of, well, how could you be their daughter if you're, if the person who's playing your father is black? Like, I'm like, well, <laughs> it's, we, it still can exist. I know these worlds. Um, and sometimes. I mean, I know like the whole justification and prof, sometimes you don't need to justify those things because it's all about connection, right? Especially with Zoom prof I, and with how we're living right now, I think we really do need that connection that those justifications just slow down the improv, I find, and just get to the meat of, of what's important in improv, right? The relationships, the connection, all of that, and what will help that. So if, if, I mean, I know like with check-ins, people talk about who they are, how, they're, what, how they want to be seen and where they're, where they're based, those kind of things. But if it's not facilitated in terms of like personal and also acceptance of, of people who they are. So in Celebration, there's, it's a cast of different people. It's a really limited rehearsal process. 
and they and the cast members come from different schools of improv and also different experiences and I kind of did that on purpose because I wanted to play with energies I wanted to play with perspectives I wanted to play with acceptance and I think it's really important for improvisers to constantly play with people with different levels because what they bring in is valuable when they are true to who they are. And I, I like the whole thing I was thinking about with this panel is the idea of assimilation, right? Because unfortunately in America, um, Asian Americans are known for, as the model minority and how we have to, we've been really good assimilators. And believe me, I have family members who are not model minorities in any sort of way. And that's fine. <laughs> like who they are is fine. And I think too many times we have been told, this is the way you're supposed to look, this is the way you're supposed to act, behave, this is the way you're supposed to sound, this is the way you're supposed to smell, this is the way you're supposed to do your hair, all these things, especially I'll say in America as opposed to Canada, which isn't a melting pot, where America, the whole idea is being melting pot. And when that happens, I've noticed that uh, people feel the safe, this way to play is playing in the dominant culture as mm -hmm. opposed to and but what is the richest things that you bring and we all know this as artists outside of being improvisers is being specific is being who you are it, because who you are no one else is no one else can bring in your life experience and when you bring in those elements of your life experience of your family's life experience of people who you know your friends life experience into your improv it's so rich it's so full it's so and people watching it and i always try to see improv as um, an audience member people watch and go yes yes thank you finally as opposed to you know it being kind of like a fun jokey jokey because um Improv is very funny. It's also so rich and deep and it can have all of that that makes plays like, you know, just written down plays um, and film. It can have all those qualities in terms of connection with an audience. Yeah, MJ said it beautifully. I, I think you need to give uh, space in the beginning to, for people to express themselves as their identities. These check-ins that Hi, I'm Max, I'm from Italy. I'm Aria, I'm from Norway. Uh, these are not just things that you say out of like, yeah, I'm calling from here, but these are just like, I don't, you know, to put you understanding what the cultural composition of, of the, of the class is. And the ratio of, of players is, is very important, I think, because, um, you cannot really have an, 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 an eight person team and then you bring in two internationals and and say, OK, now be inter now be intercultural because we're all international. Right. Uh, because we also don't want people to come in and just like, oh, so this is these are the international just like, you know, play play for us some some ethnicity. It, it's that's also not how it's how it's done. So you need to have a, a, a good ratio in it. So interestingly, I had uh, recently a, a class about East, East and West intercultural improv. And one of the things that I want insist on that class is that out of 16 people, eight has to be from the Western Hemisphere and eight has to be from the Eastern Hemisphere. And that's the bargaining terms that I, I said, you have to do this because we want to have these voices as being equals coming in. These are my stories these are my stories it's not canceling each other out it's it's bringing their own voices mm -hmm. and if you have a, a a different kind of ratio then the the ones in the minority would would need to adapt to it mm -hmm. so i also notice for instance if i'm if i'm if i'm also joining international jams i'm going i'm going to someone's houses in india or in philippines or in malaysia and then I realize I'm I'm also adapting to how they are how they are doing their improv, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's the same way. If they are coming from the east into the into the west, where it's dominated by the west, then they cannot easily just mm -hmm. hey, I'm the eastern guy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can I add something else? <laughs> yeah, or j just a, qu a quick, um, a quick comment. I would like to ask the the members uh, of the audience or people who are watching us right now live, um, if you could like think of the classes that you are taking or teaching or the shows that you're playing or jams you're in. How many countries on average you see on screen or like when during during a check in? How many locations or cultures are usually in there? J just for statistics, it would be fascinating to see um, how how big our world is. Uh, amazing. Yes, you you wanted to add something. Oh yeah, I I always always want to have a, a nice ratio of east versus west. That's my thing. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to add that. So I'm doing this kind of duos with the people around the world. Right. And these are the space where 50% is me and then 50% are people of that certain culture. Mm -hmm. And what I find is if we if we come in and say, OK, this is our word. Let's play a scene. It's going to be a Western scene. But if we take our moment, sit and just have a chat and and talk about things, then the scene will be 50 50 chance. It's either going to be here or there. Mm -hmm. I love this. I have this because the, the part about the dominant culture is that it is dominant, right? It's it's dominant not only because we assume that everybody knows those references, but also because of the power that it holds in the society, right? The, um, the universal acceptance of it, which means that when, when you have one player from a dominant culture and one from a minority, whichever minority that is. We always say that communication is a two-way street, but it's more likely that the player from the minority will come all the way and, and play within the dominant culture of, of the person. So the person who um, comes from, um, let's say, a slightly privileged background who doesn't have to think of themselves as, as a minority because they come from the US, because they come from the Western Hemisphere, because they are white. Um, they usually wouldn't have to adapt to some, some cultural specifics. They, they would ex, is, ex, expect that everybody knows their cultural specifics, right? So this is a very um, interesting point because I, uh, I've been reading a lot about the, the, the psychology of different cultures and, and cultural empathy. And the, the, the consensus or the current consensus in, um, in sociology and in, in psychological research is that a lot of um, characteristics that we use for, um, I don't know, intelligence tests or personality tests, like how, how extroverted or introverted people are, are actually wrong because they have been developed in uh, Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic societies. And the acronym for, for these societies is weird. Uh, guess what? The majority of the world is not weird. It's not Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. Which means that the, the, the place for misunderstanding is, is kind of, yeah, it's always there because an introvert in a, in a culture where introversion is the norm, is celebrated, it's, it's culturally expected. Everybody is quiet and very reserved and very like uh, uh, polite. We'll have a very different lifestyle and very different position in the society than an introvert in a very outspoken and extroverted culture where you have to be front-footed and very, um, not maybe aggressive, but very, very, very loud. Um, so even the psychology of 
what is the normal behavior then changes or what we expect as, as the normal behavior, who is the outsider and who is the norm. Um, which brings me to the question that I'd like to ask both to, to you two and to, to the audience um, as well. A, you, you've had the experience of moving in and settling in, in, in another country and maybe not even, even one country. What was your biggest revelation from like, okay, these things are different. I have to, I have to change the way I think about the world or these are the things that, that makes, make a difference for me. Um, and for the audience, if you've ever just visited another country, what was your um, mental shift, if, if you will? Uh, so uh, I am I, I come from a more privileged background so I'm of, aware of these cultural as I enter so it's uh, less of a fish out of water coming in and see oh uh, these Dutch people are doing this these these Norwegians are doing this so I'm sort of already building up to it but the, uh, a cultural difference that you would have is that um, each each person in as as a European has a more facility over themselves rather than being in in inside a, a mesh of other people. So they have more uh, ways they can express individually. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, in the culture I grew up, uh, you have to play within the society a little bit more where you are in the society. Mm -hmm you have a very good sense of where you are what you are allowed to do uh but there's not as much individual individual expression so that's that actually i mean that's life and that carries into improv you see that as well mm -hmm. so i immigrated to canada from korea when i was two and that was actually incredibly traumatic for my family and for me, um, simply because, so my father was a bank manager, my mother was as an assistant chemistry professor in Korea, and um, we had a certain lifestyle that was totally shattered in Canada. And I saw my parents um, change uh, in ways that, like, they had never, I mean, they grew up, you know, they were born into the Korean War, and they grew up in a, like, so they grew up in a in like all of those things of who they were and how they were raised and what they lost through war and then regained through incredible hard work and then lost again in Canada. All of that was and watching that was really hard um, growing up. So what I <laughs> but what I came to understand in Canada from a child was. Like there were so many great things in terms of um so then we were incredibly poor and but we were also incredibly accepted uh because i grew up in a uh in a place where it was full of immigrants from different cultures and we all kind of everyone had to look after each other because we didn't have no one had um other family right it was just so like i lived in a in a building where like the parents worked and so the parents took turns looking after the, everyone's kids and we all ate different foods uh, from different cultures and we all understood like so I grew up understanding how different cultures treated children you know um, like m my parents never made me finish my meals but some parents I had to like finish everything <laughs> and, right and and so, and um and then also I grew up like tasting so much amazing food and seeing their homes and how they decorated and how so in that way it was just I think remarkable and how even when we didn't have much and no one had much everyone was so giving and open and accepting because we needed each other like all these different families who were you know like really poor needed um support and that's how the support happened 
and then coming to and of course there are moments I grew up like where you know I was constantly told like I'm the other right like um I tell this I'm, I do a lot of personal stories and I tell the story of how when I'm five because when you're when you're um I had to be very independent so I used to, like I I went to the donut shop when I was five years old so because I felt like change in the sofa and I loved apple fritters and then on the way home I'm like um on the way home someone tells me for the first time to go back to where I come from and I'm five and I'm just thinking uh I am going back like I'm going home <laughs> like but then obviously it was to go back to um you know, to, to, to leave Canada. And so that's, so I've had those incidents growing up where I was like, where I was uh, raised in a, in a community where everyone was so supportive. And then also where I had incidences where I was told I don't belong, I should go back, I should not be where I am. Um, so those things. And then I also had adults apologize to me for misunderstandings too. So like all these little things, I think really did affect how I see the world where, um, and I'm thankful that adults when they had misconceptions of me did apologize to me at a young age. So then I knew adults can make mistakes, can own up to their, because at least I was raised very traditionally Korean where elders are revered. So um, having adults apologize to me and owning their mistakes was really, great to experience having different cultures accept me and also seeing my mother and my father accept other cultures as well was just a fabulous experience and then also having unfortunately those moments where um was but it was also helpful for me to understand that in this world that i live in i can feel safe i can um uh i can uh you know uh people can own up to their mistakes. And then there are some people who have issues, <laughs> which have nothing to do with me. And, um, and I mean, I also had amazing sisters who I could talk to about these things. And then coming to America, it was such a, because in Canada, it's a very socialist society where people really do, I feel, look out um, for each other. And you find those, um, those people, like I find, I found more people who cared about everyone than the not growing up in Toronto and also uh, traveling across Canada for work. And in America, I find that there's a lot of people who um, unfortunately weren't raised in that environment where it's very, there's so many great things about America too. I don't want to like bash America where it's, you know, it's very individualistic um, and it's very creative and there's so many opportunities that really are that don't exist in other places that I've lived in. And, uh, and there's also sometimes can be, and especially because I live in Los Angeles, a sense of arrogance and a sense of, and especially in the industry, a sense of self-importance, which I mean, honestly, if you go to so many places in the world, no one cares about Hollywood, which is great. And no one cares about media, which is terrific, right? And I think also how, like, I, I think we've all traveled so much, right? Where you see the world and you see how people live and it's, it's remarkable uh, what is valued in, in that society. And that's like really beautiful in terms of their values and what's not important, right? Like um, in certain societies, cleanliness is so important. In other societies, it isn't. And it's fine. You can still eat, you know, like it's, you can still eat the food. You can still listen to the music. You still be immersed in that culture and just accept how people live. Sorry, I talk so much. <laughs> because you're very passionate and it's so fascinating. I find what, what you're saying is such a such a perfect, it's it's weird to say that the real life is a metaphor for improv, but okay, you know what I mean, right? Um, improv is exactly like real life, which means we, we also have uh, yeah, we have the elders who sometimes model uh, the behavior for us and sometimes model the wrong kind of behavior for us. We have uh, the communities that support each other and we have communities that prefer to stay very isolated and have that sense of self-importance and yes, a certain arrogance because obviously we are the best, we've invented improv. Um, 
But the most fascinating part for me is exactly what you've said about values, because when we mention cult culture or yeah, when I when I typed in the, the title of the panel, the cultures of improv, uh, people go like, you mean food or languages or clothes or whatever. No, I mean values because there is the visible culture that is about art or music or fairy tales or food, right? What what you think when you when you um, hear about somebody's culture. But the most important part, the part that is the hardest to connect, and that is the most valuable in terms of the stories we tell, in terms of finding the connection between people, in terms of feeling the empathy for other people, in terms of um, figuring out how are we the same despite our differences. It's the part about our values, and it's the part about our beliefs. And it's the part where we can have uh, very, very different points of view and very, very different uh, reference frames, right? And, and we, if we don't know that we have those different reference frames, we might think that the other one is, is just crazy, is <laughs> mad, they're an alien, right? Uh, but if we accept that my point of view is a frame reference, uh, a frame of reference, and your point of view is a frame of reference, then we can play with them, right? And we can uh, use them to create stories that are richer and more interesting. Um, like like Ari has said, uh, and, and MJU as well, we don't need to make our world smaller if we can make it bigger and more interesting and bring it all in. Um, and, and now I'm talking a lot as well, but <laughs> let's go back to the um, audience, our wonderful audience who are watching us live. You're all amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we had a, a question from uh, George. Yes, George of the Mountains. In a scene, how should one respond or connect to a cultural reference that, that is unfamiliar? So th this goes back to our talk about Jay uh, Sukov and, and the pan. Um, how, how would you play that? I, I have at least one, one example, but I want to hear from you first. Uh, so um, I have a workshop on this intercultural improv where uh, one of the exercises that I devised was giving yourself. Uh, gi giving information about yourself to the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, it's termed like a interview, but you're self-interviewing, where you're, instead of you're interviewing for the other person, you're actually inserting some, some of your personalities in, in there. Mm -hmm. And so these are the points where you say, okay, this is who I am. I am, I am giving this to you. I'm, I'm teaching you that these things are interesting to me and you can play with those. So, so that's how you how you insert the uh, dif different things in that. So that is that is an exercise. But basically, when you're doing a, a normal scene, that's what you do as well. You you play and then they say you draw something from your own culture and you put it the, put it there. And it is it is this is the the the, the tricky part. Sort of uh, yes, you can play with this. This is a this is a ball that you can play with, and um, in in that way you you can you can introduce things to to the other person in a in a playable way, mm -hmm. and also reduce chances of being <laughs> offensive because you're saying that yeah now I'm giving you consent to play with this aspect of my culture. Awesome. And I think um, what we discussed in terms of taking things slowly, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's just a really easy way to do it. And quite frankly, do your research before, <laughs> really, uh, because I remember I was in Groundlings and they said, you know, if you don't know American cultural references, which I really don't, and I didn't, I haven't wa I didn't watch TV prior to the pandemic for like 20 years. Um, you know, they said, do your research. So that's part of being improviser, do your research of different cultures. Um, 
But in the meantime, in the in the moment when you don't know what some kind of food is, you can still, I mean, it's clear that it's food, right, Pan? So you can still like smell it. And you don't have to like go, oh, how amazing, or anything like that. You could go, oh, I never like, you know, like you could play in so many different ways. Um, and then obviously then your your partner will, uh, will add to it and allow that. Sometimes um, you improvisers talk too much. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think they talk too much in scenes. So <laughs> you just like, <laughs> you can well, honestly do, right, do an action, which is it's it, when you do an action and you, um, that's a yes and moment, right? It's, you don't have to go, you can, you don't have to say anything sometimes. It's clear what you're, that you're accepting and you're building already. Um, you're building it slowly, which is terrific. And then allow the other improviser to, to, um, to build as well. Oh, and I also want to say with the whole thing with, because I find some improvisers, they want to be such good partners that when they come in with a specific point of view, uh, when and their partner comes with a different point of view, they want to adapt to their partner's point of view, and you don't need to keep your point of view because um, yes, because then that like those things really make it rich and deep as well when you maintain that point of view. So. I, I, I want to add that um, how you expand your cultural references and understand is it's not a one shot thing. And it's 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 just going on an ongoing kind of thing. So one of the things I find beautiful is when you do a scene, you realize that there's a point like I didn't quite understand that thing. And then after the scene, you go like, so what was that? Mm -hmm. And then you start to research about that. So a lot of scenes I have is uh, after after the scene was is more interesting because oh, so that's why that's what it is. That's what it is. And now you have more things in. In, in in yourself for the next scene and the next scene. So it's not just a simple solution in one scene. It's uh, how do you play with more cultural reference? Because you become a better person. You become a curious person that uh, is curious in, in understanding things about the world. Yes. Oh, I love this so much. Yes, by by staying very open to to experiences and also willing to learn to get something to know you you make your world bigger and you stay open to this world right you you are a better person and a better improviser hey yes um amazing I, by becoming I, a better person you automatically become a better improviser <laughs> yes that's how that's how it works um i have two examples uh for for this i think uh building on on top of what you have said already like playing emotionally playing with what it is adding adding your reaction to that adding a true um, emotional reaction and also accepting that whatever it is I, I don't know what that blue blue thing blue goo is i don't need to know but i i i I can believe 100% that if my partner is bringing it in, it's a gift, it's an offer, it's part of something that they want me to be excited about, they want me to be inspired by it. So I will treat it as a thing that I'm inspired by and, and amazed by. Um, I, I remember, uh, yeah, and another point is, don't let the reality to limit your imagination. I think this is one of the most beautiful lessons I've learned from Patty Styles. Um, when somebody brought in um, a culture of reference that the other improviser did not know, like uh, uh, the name of a TV series or something, and she went, well, you don't know what orange is the new black is say great i love culinary shows now you're in a new reality where orange is the new black is it is a culinary show um but i also have a personal example i i taught a workshop for the beginners where um i i very explicitly told them not to be limited not to let the reality limit their imagination be because we were 
in an absolutely marvelous historic location. We were in a 17th century Swedish pirate house, and it would have been so easy to just stick to what we see because it was like amazing rooms with lots of historic artifacts. But one of the improvisers, he, he's, he's from India, and he was so in the flow, he was so inspired that he brought up a historic Indian um, person, um, a historic Indian reference, and then kind of realized where, where he is and froze for a moment. And then remember, don't let the reality limit your imagination. You know what? There was a, an Indian courtesan living in this house. And everybody cheered because it was so beautiful. Um, great. We, we have lots of, lots of comments, lots of people uh, commenting on, on wonderful, um, <laughs> wonderful cultural differences that they have noticed, like whether or not there is, there is or there is no small talk or whether it's more individual oriented or collective oriented and it's all absolutely fascinating but i'd like to ask um one more question that is um yeah i guess it's it's related to uh, to to the saddest part of of bringing up somebody's culture and dear audience if you have any examples of that please bring it up as well what would you do if somebody brings in um, or mentions a culture or a specific, um, makes a specific reference to your culture and it's a stereotype? It's something so uh, like very commonly portrayed in the media or um, um, in the Hollywood movies that people kind of don't realize that this is a stereotype and it could be offensive, but they bring in an accent or they bring in a profession. Um, like I've seen, I cannot say that I've never seen Russians played in, in improv. I've seen Russians in improv scenes and pretty much like 99 improv scenes uh, with, with Russians in them were about Russian spies. I've seen maybe only one where you, a Russian was something else. Um, which again, if I see one more scene where a Russian character is there only because they're a spy, why do you bring Russian then? Why do you, like what? Um, but I, I get too emotional while that was supposed to be question what can we do when that happens what do you feel when that happens um what if any um are the examples of that or how do um, i get really angry <laughs> 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 you know uh, you're supposed to go through the process of you know oh maybe they just made a mistake all of that i just get angry I, and then i get sad uh because then I go, is that really how they see um, people? <laughs> like, you know, and then I also, I mean, it's, I go through so many different emotions, to tell you the truth. Because then I just go, well, then maybe they just don't know any better and all this, that stuff. Um, there have been times where I've been labeled things I've been incredibly uncomfortable with and that I've called them out on in the, in the scene just because I'm not going to accept it anymore. And I think at this point in my life, um, I shouldn't be, I'm not taking that label. Like I'm not accepting that label and I'm not going to because I'm not going to be polite about it. It's just uh, mm. like, for example, I was labeled a porn star. I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be polite about that. I just, that's just wrong. It's wrong in so many ways. So, mm. um, uh, so, but I do go through the process and what I find the most upsetting is when I don't have, I don't, I'm not supported afterwards by the team that's when or the leadership that's when it's very upsetting it's like i'm the one who who was wrong with not accepting the label in an improv scene and which did happen um so 
that's that's uh, that's hard. Yeah, that um, one that one would be very hurtful because it's more intentional rather than spur of the moment, is it? Yeah. I mean, they they justified it by saying uh, they were trying to like you know um, like up the funny, right? Which obviously, as an improviser, you know, you don't go for the funny. You just you go for it, right? Because then, um, if you're just going for the funny, it's it's. I mean, it's 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 kind of like it's. I don't. It's not, I don't want to be like mean. But if you're just going for the funny in an improv scene, it's a bit cheap, right? Can I say mm-hmm. that? <laughs> like, yeah. so I anyway. Uh, uh, no, so it's painful when you're labeled those things, and then it makes you feel like uh, you. I can't play certain parts. I can't play certain roles. I can't. I can't be sexy, right? <laughs> like, but we all are sexy in our own way. So those kind of things, it's just really hard. Uh, when I see it on stage, luckily I don't see it very often anymore. And obviously, we're not seeing it on stage. Um, uh, and I think I've been intentional in terms of what kind of uh, Zoom prov I've been seeing, just because it's it's so. But I think it's it's what what I I think audiences are smart enough to go no and to not accept certain labels anymore. Hopefully, um, Ari, <laughs> we <did. laughs> yeah. I didn't want to cut you off. Uh... Yeah, so um, I think at some point in our improv careers, we build more facilitation. You know, we build more skills to defend ourselves and say, like, I'm not going to take that shit, right? I've I've played as an Asian laundromat guy for a long time before I finally stepped out in in the scene. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not here. To, I'm I'm not the worker. I'm a PhD who is a customer at your place. And I've also had uh, people who, st- who started giving suggestions as, uh, okay, the suggestion is fat camp. And then I immediately come in as the sergeant. It's like, okay, everyone, every, everyone uh, reduce your weight. And so I'm not going to play uh, as, as, as victim. But it's, it's a very hard thing to build up upon, upon that. Um, for my part, though, it, interestingly, because as an Indonesian, a lot of cultural refer, uh, cultural stereotypes missed me because uh, I'm neither Chinese, neither Japanese, neither Korean. I I mean, in in life, I was walking on the street, and then there was a there was a, a boy on a on a bicycle, and he said, uh, "Ni hao, ni hao." It's like I'm not I'm not Chinese, and then. He actually turned back and then comes back with the bicycle. It's like sayonara, sayonara. First of all, that's the wrong word, and second of all, it's the, the wrong the wrong reference. So, every things are missed a, a lot more with with Indonesia, and I feel like this is the time that I can actually introduce like what is what is it actually Indonesia? What is a it's a more complex kind of thing that you cannot just like. You've seen this, and then you play, label these things. Um, I I think having Zoom improv and having more time to like uh, like longer scenes, slower scenes to to like deconstruct that gives them way more opportunity to do that. Whereas short form has like the tendency you have to go. There used to be a uh, there used to be a game that is. Uh, all right, continue the scene in Japan and continue the scene in in uh, Malaysia, continue the scene in Peru. And then basically what it does is just it takes the most stupid stereotypes out of it, right? It's Now it's a very flawed game now to think of it, but it's still being played somewhere here, here and there. Yeah. Um, yeah, but if you have the, the time to just like unpack it, like, okay, it's Indonesian, what is Indonesian? It's Russian. Not not every Russian is a spy, right? There's a lot of layers in in being a Russian. I'm not gonna use the Matryoshka reference, but yeah. So so like these these kind of things. Like you take you if you're grabbing things so fast, like I did right now, mm-hmm. become reflex. You get into the most mm-hmm. easy pickings, which are also not not 
yeah, not not the best, not the most authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can totally agree with that. Um, also, because we we've got um, a question, which is how do we feel about doing an accent as part of a character? And for me, um, I don't. I think accents are a valid way or. A very specific voice could be a valid way to to build a character. Uh, for me, it's usually a problem when an accent is the only way to mark that it's a, a character from a specific culture. So I don't know anything about that culture. So I don't know anything about the Russians. So I'm going to speak with a really hard Russian accent and make it sound very angry. And then it's like, if this is, first of all, if this is all you know about Russia, or if you think that this is a character, then maybe your character work needs an upgrade. Um, like, don't, don't use it as, I, I'm doing an accent, therefore I have a character, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if, if your accent comes in, um authentically because you speak the language um and and just for for reference i think um among us three we have something like a dozen languages uh i'm pretty sure we do um if if you speak the language you can um it won't be even an accent you can just switch to that language and continue in that language right even if you don't speak it fluently, but you know a few words, you, you can say them convincingly, you will still come, come across more authentically than doing, um, doing an accent for the sake of comedy. Because again, a lot of accents come across as, as the butt of the job, the joke. Right, so we are using them only because they sound funny. They're not funny. This is simply a, a person speaking another language with the rules of their own language, right? In in real life. So if you're mocking them for the sake of fun, you're not doing accent. You're not doing character work. You're doing something entirely different. And it's very related to stereotypes and it's not uh, exactly good improv. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I, I think accent as the butt of the joke is, is really bad. Accent as, as being the character is, is really bad. And I think accent or more generally, uh, you're, you're playing in a different culture uh, depends on how far or how close you are to that culture, right? So if if I'm only playing a, an accent of an Argentinian, where I've never been to Argentina, it's going to be coming very cartoonish and it will become more of the butt of the joke uh, as the character. But if I want to play an accent in, in th a Thai accent, since I'm half Thai, I feel I have the license to do that because I know actual actual people who speaks like that. These and these people are real real people, not characters that you have filtered to some mainstream media and see it on on a Hollywood in in an old Hollywood film. So whenever you're pulling an accent or a cultural thing, it it shouldn't be like the outer layer of the onion. You, if you do something, you should have something to back it up. Like I can, I can say this, I can do this because I know way more about this particular culture that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing. But if I don't know anything about this culture and I'm just playing that accent as, uh, as a joke, then it's empty. Yeah, it's hollow. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think maybe um, some improvisers, I mean, improv is you do things in the moment but character work is when you're practicing and you're like practicing over and over again seeing the world as your character and that involves and if your character does have an accent then you're practicing that you're not just doing it and it has to be 
the best characters are when they're based in when they're authentic when they're based in on people you know um, because I mean there's so many improvisers around the world who do amazing characters so if you like you need to do you, that's your homework right to uh, to practice that over and over again and to and the funny thing with accents and you hear this right where there isn't one type of accent. Like, you know, there isn't one type of Korean accent. There isn't, there isn't one type of Canadian accent. There isn't one type of American accent. There's so many. And also based on where, uh, how we grew up, how people, where they lived, where they, uh, I have family from all different parts of the world and their accent is not like, you know, um, from one place. And that's, and that's when you can create a rich character where you know their life, you know their world, you know where they lived, you know, all of those details and that's what it requires to do character work to have all those details about them like that then um then i think you can also speak like them and i don't think i mean i i think with like when you think of it as an accent it's like ha 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 kind of right like let's do the typical accent but when you think about like you're speaking like your character you're being your character that's not i don't i remember i did this radio uh drama and someone had said to me, uh, there was nothing Korean about this part, but they want they cast me because they wanted um, something in the voice, whatever. And they said to me, you do, you realize what you, certain words that you say or whatever, certain your inflection. And this was um, a Korean director who had said this, right? And I was like, is, is that you speak very Korean in English? And I was like, that's interesting. And then, but then when I did like listen back to how, what I sounded like at that age, I was like, oh, I could, I now I understand what she was saying because um, there was something about my tone when I was that old uh, that, and it's also because I spoke so much Korean then that there was like a certain um, way that it wasn't, I don't, I won't say when it was necessarily Korean, but it was something that was very specific that was not like every day. Right, that was right for this character that I could see why then she cast me for this part. Um, but I remember when she said, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I never really thought about that. And then reflecting and hearing my voice at 17, I was like, yes, I, now I, I, I do see that quality that you wanted. And um, there was nothing Korean about that character, but I think it did add a layer in terms of just the vocal quality. So I think, I think it's about approaching character work in a deep and uh, in a very rich and specific way that allows you to speak as that character. Yeah, I think when I do an accent, I try to re represent a, a character and not just like a, a, a grayed out, mushed out culture. And I would do a I would do an accent of someone I actually know and adore. And when I do that, you would realize like you're playing their accent not to not to make fun of but it, it's a it's a, to honor them this is this is who they are this is how you bring out so this these characters you you play has to be you're like you're honoring this character yeah the intention also matters like whether you're doing it for a joke or to to mock somebody or simply because you don't know anything else uh, about that that uh, culture that language or if you want to um honor them uh by by making it very specific about them yeah um i love that um it's it's um it, it brings me to um uh, another question actually um which is um, yeah, two, two questions that are related. First question is, is for the audience, actually. Um, when you think about the shows that you see or that you play, what are the most common names that you hear? And what are the names that are not there? If if we want to put it that way. Um, and I'm talking about it because uh, Hazel has posted a lot of wonderful comments uh, about how it, how wonderful it would have been to 
to have um, somebody mention her her country as somebody mentioned in um, Finland uh, uh, in in a scene, except that never happens, um, um, which is not true. I I live in Sweden. We do play about we do play shows with with things in them, uh, but I'm not sure it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but but here is here is the thing, and um, I want to talk about this because MJ, you made a very specific point about it in your show, asking everybody to pick up the names from their culture that they uh, love and that they would like to use, and then letting people rename themselves, re rename. Um, or name their characters themselves. And Ari, you have uh, post wrote, um, you have written a, a blog post um, uh, about this um, a, a while ago, actually, um, which was wonderful. Um, and I guess the question is um, why? Why is the majority of names that we hear are of Anglo-Saxon origin? So we 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 constantly hear uh, characters being named Jack, Jane, uh, Barbara, um, Emily, and probably Fred. But I haven't seen characters named Mario or Ari or um, or Zalman, um, or when that happens, people kind of react like this is this is a big thing. This is then the point of the scene that somebody is named that. Um, what is your take on that? Oh. So uh, I come from Indonesia. Indonesia is a Muslim country, right? So a lot of people have names are Muhammad, and. I remember playing in Europe and I just threw out the name is your Muhammad and everyone uh, players audience goes goes like what does that mean what's this supposed to be right and you don't want to you don't want to have that kind of behavior where you're using a name and then everyone suddenly tends up and sees like this name must have a meaning mm -hmm. um and when when that happens, you sort of you won't use those names again. You would start go back to Bob and Fred. Um, so this has to be done um, with patience. With uh, um, a, a, a lot of times, you get these Anglo-Saxon names is because you have this thing about okay. In a scene, everyone has has to name someone, and it's like okay, your order is here, um, Mr. Bob. Yeah, you have to give a name. And th this is like the thing that you're like scrimmaging. Uh, is it scrimmaging? Like trying to get an object that's as as quickly as possible to you instead of breathing and just like understanding this. So uh, I don't think I actually answered this. But name, name means something in a culture, but it doesn't have to be the point of the scene is that wow your name is yada yada right mm -hmm. I, I mean my daughter's in middle school and when um i've seen the roster of her of her classmates they're all different like they're all unique they're all they're i mean they're all there are some uh jacks and stuff but there's so many other names and also spellings of names and stuff that are that are very specific to that person and I do think, you know, it took us a long time to figure out my daughter's name. And I think that's with parents, right? We all, we take so much time to name our children. And the reason why I have um, my cast name themselves is because I also want them to be able to identify and label their own culture in terms of how they um, want to be seen in this specific uh, improvised play that they're uh, performing in. I have to admit that I it's safe to name, you know, Jack and Jill and it's safe at times, especially in short form, because what's in your head, right, uh, 
living in Los Angeles. Those are the those are very common names um, that come to your head in long form and in narrative. We have the time to to um, to build the world together, which I think um, is you. So then you have you can give that quality to yourself. And in Zoomprov, you can name yourself, which is terrific. But I think there is importance in um, in a name in improv where the improviser can give themselves, you know, that permission to be themselves. And I think that's why I like to name myself as well. But I can only do that when I feel that everyone else in the cast is on board, right? Mm -hmm. Even when I know that they're really good people and stuff, but I don't know, I don't know if they're accepting of that where they won't go what let's you know tell him tell me about your name <laughs> right like you know which it's like that like stops everything in improv right what like, does that mean yeah you have to like you know you're and i don't really like um improv where it's teaching each other right like i like i like building the world i like all that stuff where so uh i think in order for me to to name myself that's culturally specific to me in a scene or in a show, then I need to know that everyone else is on board and mm -hmm. that they won't go. And I know that they're well-intentioned sometimes, like, oh, that's such so fascinating. But I hate that too. I don't know if you grew up with, with like, oh, you know, tell me what you eat, like, right? <laughs> like, cause I'm like, you know, you, there's tons of Korean restaurants. You can find out yourself. I'm not your teacher. There's also that aspect where I don't really feel like I need to teach about my culture. And also there's a part of me that feels like I'm not an expert on my culture either. I can only talk about what I know and what um, is meaningful to me, but there's, everyone has their own viewpoint on what's meaningful for them in their own culture, right? So yeah. I don't want to be, don't make me the expert because that's uncomfortable as well. Yeah. There is a wonderful TED talk, which is called uh, The Danger of a Single Story. And it's all about how we 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 see the cultures portrayed in a very specific way, and then we we only want to know about that kind of confirmations for that single story. To me, bringing in um, names from our own cultures, or not necessarily even your own culture, but whichever culture you feel like playing with. Uh, is important for for two uh, of of the reasons that we've mentioned before. One is because telling a single story is dangerous because it reinforces stereotypes. It reinforces the the understanding that all Russians are um, spies or low life criminals or whatever or. Indonesians probably don't even exist. It's just the wrong type of Chinese, I guess. Right. Um, uh, or that Italians are obviously all waiters who only talk about pasta um, or, or pizza. All right, so changing that single story starts from small details and starts from, from normalizing um, the multitude of uh, points of view, the multitude of beliefs and multitude of, of stories. But a, a more interesting point is just normalizing it so that it doesn't sound weird. I mean, it's kind of a vicious circle, right? And, and I think I really, you, you said it very explicitly in the very beginning, you want to bring it in, but if if everybody, is weirded out, you don't bring it in. So everybody will, will keep being weirded out because it's still an anomaly. It's still something that, that is very unusual and very strange. But if we keep bringing those names in, renaming ourselves or naming our partners, then uh, I guess there will be a, a point where it's like the critical mass is reached and it's like, yeah, of course, if even if in my improv class or in my improv shows, none of the names, none of the performers is from, from the US, there is absolutely no point 
in naming all of our characters, um, Jack, Jill, Emily, and, and Bob, right? Let's name ourselves um, Marco, Antonio, um, Lars, and well, just maybe Mohammed or Isa. And, and that's right, we don't need to justify it, it's there. We just play ourselves or what we know. Um, and then, yeah, the, the more normal that, that becomes, the less questionable it will be, I hope. Yeah, so even, um, even though names carry uh, some weight to them, otherwise, otherwise, you know, a baby is born, it's like, I guess that's Bob, you know? <laughs> you don't do that, right? You, you take your time to do that. But we want the name to have weight, but al also of, of equal weight either way. So that we want a world where people can name me Bob with the mm -hmm. same amount of weight that I can name them uh, some some person of like do 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 this like of my uh, school friend, mm -hmm. and the impact is about the same. Instead of Bob is okay, but do do is strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I love this conversation because it, it reminds um, we, we basically we covered uh, all of the points of two research articles that uh, I wanted to share and that I hope Summer could post in, in, in the chat for, for us. Um, and those two articles are about um, ethnocultural empathy, or how, how do we build our understanding of, of each other despite our differences and focusing on, on our similarities. And those, those points were, so the, there are five obstacles to cultural empathy, and there are four ways why, how we can be more empathetic for, for one another. So the obstacles are the lack of, of general knowledge outside of your own culture, the ethnocentrism. You think that my culture is the only one that exists and everybody like everybody else is an outlier. Um, and the, the, in addition to the lack of knowledge, also the lack of experience. If you've never met anyone outside of your culture, you probably, you won't even know that they exist. Um, the lack of specific knowledge about other cultures, like I don't know what that thing is that you're bringing in, so I'm very hesitant to take it in. Um, and the lack of specific experiences, which means I may not recognize your nonverbal behavior or I may not recognize what, um, what signals you are sending or what what the subtext of, of the scene is. Um, but the biggest obstacle is you, you may lack the specific knowledge or the specific experience, but the biggest obstacle is when you don't want to engage. Mm -hmm. Is when you, you go, you know what? I know that there are other cultures. I don't care. Everybody is the same. Full stop. Um, but the four ways of how we can be more culturally empathetic is by um, uh, understanding how a person from, from a different background thinks or feels. And, and that's like what we talked in the beginning, like different frames and different perspective taking. Um, it's um, communication empathy. It's when I'm able to recognize your nonverbal behavior or your signal, or at least to guess that maybe my signals are different from yours, which, which, is, which is true for most culture. And then also the, the awareness, the empathic awareness of how different cultures are represented in the media, in the movies, and how not all of those representations are actually good and kind of going against that, those stereotypes or 
being aware of, I don't want to get into the, the, the discussion of ra racial differences because uh, I don't feel it's my place to talk about this, but um, it's, it's the same discussion of how different ethnicities and how different races are represented in the media is very different from the lived experience of people from, from those backgrounds. And also what history is taught. Yes. I feel, yeah. you know, uh, living in Canada and America, we have a certain history that um, negates other people's contribution to the land that has been built. So, uh, and investigating that and maintain that curiosity of, of that. Yes, absolutely. So just bringing in um, all, all of the things that, um, that we, we could add together that hopefully will make our skins richer. Like we said, it probably will make us better humans. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, it also like from the storytelling point of view, I think it, it just, the tendency is we, we would kind of, we are searching for something unusual. We're searching for unusual locations or new ideas or something. So we come up, we, we ask for suggestions or come up with our own suggestions. Like what's the location? Disneyland or the line at the DMV. Is that really the most exciting location you can start from? Um, but if we, if we have all those people in our classes or or in our shoes who come from different cultures, maybe we don't need to go on Mars or play cats in the kitchen. Maybe we could just play humans who have very different perspectives and it's wonderful. It, absolutely. So in one of my workshops, we had the location is a government office, right? And then if you just immediately, okay, government office, let's play a scene. It's probably gonna be like one type of scene. But just like, what is a government office and hear stories from different <laughs> different places around the world that creates new scenes, right? This creates new emphasis on the scenes. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, I do, so I always like the cast to pick which suggestion they want to play with, mm -hmm. because I think that makes a huge difference as well. And I want, and know that whatever suggestion comes up, no one ever has to play it on the nose. Like I, I, you could be inspired by it and you can go deeper within that suggestion as an improviser. Yes, I love that. Um, I, um, I think we've been talking for more than um, one and a half hours and the questions are, uh, are coming, but I think we've covered most of them. Um, if you still have questions and you, if you want to, learn how to play with different cultures and bring in specifics and have fun with that, please go watch uh, the celebration show that is directed by MJ and that has finished the run at the nursery and will be playing at the um, Impro Theater. Even yes, on our Twitch, uh, Twitch um, it's at Saturdays yes. for the next four weeks at 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific Coast time. So I'm sorry. Uh, that's like 10 p.m. GMT, and then IST is like 12.30 a.m. or yeah. something like that. I think it's better if you post the links and, oh, okay. <laughs> and people will figure it out. Um, and also, um, yeah, you're very welcome to the workshops that uh, Tanin and I are teaching on the 1st of March. This is the closest workshop which is called Bring Your World on Stage. And it's all about how we can have fun when we are all building our new and beautiful world. And also Ari is teaching um, his own uh, version of playing with people from different cultures. And he has a wonderful series of 10-minute um, videos where he is demonstrating his skills with improvisers from all over the world uh, on, his, on his web page. Um, thank you so much for for sharing this evening with me. That 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 was absolutely amazing. I love talking to you both. So for me, it was just 
just a lovely evening. Um, thank you so much to our audience for um, participating in the in the discussion and uh, leaving all your comments and uh, questions and you're all wonderful. And if you're watching this panel uh, later on, don't hesitate to drop me a message and I'll make sure to organize more of these panels because I'm not gonna shut up. <laughs> I'm trying to bring everybody <laughs> and make our world better, a better place. Thank you so much and good night. Bye.